welcome to the eighth annual My Arizona Lecture. Um, it's really great to be back here on the bridge of the USS Enterprise. Uh, my name is Jeff Bannister, and I'm a research social scientist in the Southwest Center and in, here at the School of Geography and Development. And I'm Tom's colleague as well. So it's absolutely my pleasure to present Tom Sheridan today, your My Arizona Lecturer. Um, just a couple of small items of business that we have to take care of. Uh, Tom and I are going to dance a little jig when uh, we transfer over from me to him because I have to, to mic him and wire him up, or he may be wired already. Um, so that, that will be sl slightly awkward. Um, another thing that, has to, or that would be great to have happen is uh, if you haven't signed in in the back, please do so we can uh, track you down and send you emails. <laughs> We would never do that. <laughs> okay. Um, so we want to give special thanks today, uh, in particular, to uh, Pro Regents Professor Diana Liverman, uh, who, uh, whose personal generosity uh, has really, really helped to get this My Arizona Lecture Series started uh, and to keep it going. So thank you very much, Diana. We very much appreciate your, your support. Uh, the School of Geography also would like to thank uh, people who have contributed to the school over the years. Uh, and we have a variety of means to do that as well, um, which uh, you can see through our website um, here at geography.arizona.edu. But we have different levels of, of support and donation that we'd like to, to uh, call your attention to. And, and these are some of the original donors to our program. Uh, Alexander von Humboldt, staunch supporter of the School of Geography and Development. <laughs> Uh, Strabo uh, and Varinius, and each of these areas is, is, or each of these is a different area that you could contribute to. Uh, we have a seat faculty fund for faculty, that would be for faculty, yes, did I say that? Uh, we have the uh, research, uh, student research support fund, which I highly recommend. Uh, and we have a technology and infrastructure fund, so that helps us buy, uh, you know, things like laptops and all the GIS equipment that we need. Uh, and then we also have a fund for the Master's in Development Practice program, um, and that as well helps to get students out, I believe, into the field. Um, and I'm going to come back to that in a second because I have a, a personal experience that um, was made possible through donations um, to, by, by the Southwest Center years ago, and that's actually how I came to meet Tom, uh, Tom Sheridan. So, Geography has been around the University of Arizona since 1892. Um, and interestingly, that was the year in which a very large debate began in the Royal Geographic Society in Britain about whether or not to admit uh, women into the society. That argument actually wasn't settled until 1913 when they did finally admit women. Uh, and then many decades later, um, in 1961, we have a fully fledged geography department here at the University of Arizona which at the time was in the School of Business. Uh, and then in 1984, I believe, the School of, or the, uh, we became a Department of Geography and Regional Development. Uh, we split off from the business school. And since that time, uh, we have become the School of Geography and Development. And we have several different majors, uh, undergraduate majors, urban, urban uh, and regional development, we have physical geography, geographic information systems, human cultural geography, political geography, all kinds of geographic dimensions here. Uh, we have a BA in environmental studies uh, and a BS in geographic information science uh, and technology, which is a fully online um, BS degree. We have a very vibrant master's and PhD program in human cultural geography, <coughs> master's of development practice, which I've already mentioned, and a master of science in information te technology. So we have several majors running concurrently and people are out Geography people are out researching geographic things all the time, each and every day. Uh, so this is what's happening here at the School of Geography. And I love this photograph of the University of Arizona in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> That's incredible. Yeah. So uh, some of the past luminaries of the My Arizona Lecture. Um, we had Julio Betancourt, who was talking about buffalo grass to start things off in 2009. Uh, my colleague at the Southwest Center, Maribel Alvarez, who talked about foodways in the Southwest. Uh, Corky Poster, who was talking about urban development, urbanism, and architecture. Uh, Allison Deming, who I think I just saw right there. Hello. Excellent. 
welcome back, uh, who was talking about her uh, migration west from the Northeast into Tucson. Excellent, uh, excellent talk. Chris Impey from UA Astronomy, who gave a mind-blowing lecture about the stars that I still don't totally understand. Um, and Laura Lopez Hoffman, who talked about uh, Tucson as a landscape transition zone um, and how we're tied to that landscape. So we've had some incredible lectures through this uh, My Arizona series. We've been very, very fortunate. Today, we um, are, in, uh, we're, we're fortunate to have Dr. Thomas Sheridan, who's a research, research anthropologist at the Southwest Center uh, and at the, in the School of uh, Anthropology here at the University of Arizona. He's been working for four decades on ethnographic and ethnohistoric research in the Southwest and Northwest Mexico. Uh, he was the director of ethnohistorical research here at the Arizona State Museum for several years before coming to the Southwest Center past chair of the Kanoa Heritage Foundation, and a primary mover and shaker uh, in the Sonora Desert Conservation Plan, which affects probably every one of us in the room uh, each and every day. So uh, Tom has done some incredible public service and outreach work, uh, as well as his uh, really an amazing scholarship. And here are some of Tom's goodies. Um, this, and this is what I wanted to kind of come back to, too. So Tom uh, is a beautiful writer, and I think in many ways, Tom, you are the reason why I decided to come back to graduate school. Um, years ago, in 1994, I took a, a graduate yeah, class. <laughs> yes, I won't tell them all, you know, the whole story, but uh, we, I took a course called In the Wake of the Green Revolution um, with Tom Sheridan and Tom McGuire. We traveled to the state of Sonora, and we were kind of following the, the trail of agricultural development uh, and marine resources development in Sonora. It was really an incredible class, uh, field research. And um, that got me hooked into some other people uh, in Sonora. And, and after I graduated with my master's in Latin American studies, I ended up living in Mexico and working for almost four years after that, vowing never to return to graduate school. Um, but then, but then uh, I kind of to sort of I uh, feel nostalgic and uh, remember some of the things I read, so, uh, many of which Tom had written. And I started to kind of go back to some of those old, um, some of the old books, actually, many of which I brought down with me. I'm not sure why, but. Um, and I ultimately decided to come back. And that Green Revolution trip, which had support from the Southwest Center, uh, I think influenced a lot of people. Um, uh, Tom, and, Tom and Tom did that course, I think, for several years. Uh, and I think it really is, uh, a testament to the, to the power that one can have by helping fund graduate students in the field. Anyway, so what I wanted to do, oh yes, you're probably wondering what this is. Um, so I was you know, kind of messing around Googling Tom's book titles and you'd just be amazed what happens when you Google the phrase where the dove calls. Uh, this, is, this is Woody, a Pomeranian apparently, that uh, has something to do with doves. I'm not sure what. <laughs> anyway, totally random, totally random. Um, before we get to the project at hand then, um, I wanted to read just briefly, because I don't think Tom will be reading from this, a quick ex excerpt from uh, his book, Arizona a History, which I'm using for a course I'm teaching this semester. And the thing that I've always appreciated about Tom's work is that he manages to write, of course, beautifully, but also in a very personal way, um, even when it's you know, this is, a, this is a very serious work of, uh, of, of academic research. And this is the preface uh, to this fairly sizable book on the history of Arizona. I'll just read it really quickly. He writes, I grew up in Phoenix, a child of the boom in a subdivision carved out of citrus groves just south of the, of the Arizona Canal. Soon after my family moved there in 1955, we began making pilgrimages up the Beeline Highway to a neighbor's log cabin under the Mogollon Rim. I remember sitting beside my mother on a chase lounge, <clears throat> excuse me, in the back of a pickup truck as we drove up Oxbow Hill to Payson. The Tonto Basin seemed to stretch around us forever in a series of yellow hills that led to mysterious places like Pumpkin Center and the Sierra Anchas. But the country that capt captured my imagination most was the Mazatzal Mountain Range whose blue outline dominated the western horizon. The Mazatzals were dark and deep, and to my young eyes, they embodied all the mystery and grandeur of the west. No one took me into them then. That came later. 
For 13 years, they fer fermented into that most powerful of drugs, wilderness, only in my mind. So this is, uh, if you have, have had a chance to read this book, you should go out and buy it immediately. It's an incredible history of Arizona, um, and it's actually quite good for undergraduate classes as well. That kind of writing, uh, I believe, permeates almost all of Tom's work, and uh, I'm very proud to be your colleague, Tom, so thanks so much. <laughs> to uh, make you up here. Let's see. Okay. So. What Jeff didn't tell you is that Tom McGuire and I are just glad we never got arrested for the Green Revolution course. <laughs> Finan knows what I'm talking about. Okay, is this, is this on, yeah. this one? Okay, good. All right, well, thank you very much. It's really an honor to be here. Uh, I got my minor long ago in geography, so uh, I'd like to thank the School of Geography for that. And uh, today I want to talk about the Hopi History Project and the book that resulted from that, or the first volume that resulted from that project, Mokis and Castilum, Spaniards, Ho Hopi Spaniards, and the Trauma of History. The Hopi History Project is a formal collaboration between the University of Arizona and the Hopi tribe. It began in 2001 with a series of five grants from the National Historic Preservation and Records Commission. And then uh, we continued with a We the People grant from the National Endowment for the Humanities in 2008. So it's been one of those 15-year projects that I think a lot of academics have at least on their back burner. And this is a picture of the man who really inspired this work, Emery Esikiwakwaptua, who was at the Arizona State Museum for decades and the Department of Anthropology. So the goals of the Hopi History Project uh, developed out of the Office of Ethnohistorical Research where I worked uh, for really for most of my career except for the last 14, 13 years here at the University of Arizona. And as part of that work, the, the, may, our major goal was to make the enormous Spanish colonial documentary record more accessible to scholars and the general public. And as part of that program, we published a series of documentary histories on particular topics where we selected uh, Spanish colonial documents transcribed them, translated them, annotated them, and then published them. Uh, but this program, uh, this project is different because what we did here at the U of A was to do what we always do, which is to select and translate those documents. But then our colleagues <clears throat> in the Hopi Cultural Preservation Office, particularly Stuart B. Koyayumtua, recorded oral traditions about the Spaniards from Hopi elders. And that allowed us to compare and contrast these two lines of evidence about the past. And uh, producing a volume like volume one, Mokis and Castilum, you'll see it in your drugstore checkout lines, I'm sure. <laughs> Uh, is one result. We also hope that we can adapt some of this material into Hopi school curriculums so that the Hopis can tell their story about their history. And one of the reasons why I wanted to do that is because I had just finished a documentary history of the Seri Indians and called Empire of Sand. And I was 
unsatisfied and disappointed that I hadn't tried to record or, or search for any oral traditions that the Combecock, the series, might have had about the Spaniards. So I resolved that if we did another project like this in the future, uh, we'd take that two-pronged approach. And that's because uh, the documentary record is almost fatally biased and one-sided. That record has been written, whether it's by Spaniards or by British or by Anglo-Americans. It has never been written by Native Americans because the peoples of the Southwest and Northern Mexico were non-literate. Uh, it's distorted by cultural biases. It's uh, uh, often written according to political agendas of missionaries or officials or soldiers. And moreover, it has enormous silences. There's uh, huge domains of native culture and society that, are, that were either deemed not worthy of recording or that the, you know, the Europeans or Euro-Americans simply weren't aware of. So, we felt that in order to begin to correct that imbalance, we would explore the oral traditions of the Hopi to tell their side of the story. Unfortunately, in anthropology, uh, at least in, the United, in North America, and probably in other disciplines as well, uh, during most of the 20th century, anthropologists ignored oral traditions, or dismissed oral traditions. Uh, that's interesting because the early anthropologists in the Southwest took the oral traditions of Pueblo people like people quite seriously, people like Jesse Walter Fuchs. But beginning in the 19-teens, anthropologists like Robert Lowy dismissed these oral traditions as myths said that they have no uh, historical value or accuracy. And that continued throughout most of the 20th century, with few exceptions. In the last 20 or 25 years, however, a number of anthropologists, like my colleague T.J. Ferguson here in the School of Anthropology, uh, have begun to work in collaboration with Native people and to explore these oral traditions and are recognizing the incredible historical value that they have. Not just for, for the record when Europeans first entered this area in the 1500s, but in the so-called prehistoric period before the Europeans arrived. Now, just like every other line of evidence, whether it's archaeological or documentary or ethnographic, you have to interpret these oral traditions. Nonetheless, they, I'm convinced, more and more convinced, that they are a very important and extremely underused line of evidence about our shared past. So, that record for the Hopi, the record between Hopi encounters with Europeans and Euro-Americans, began with the Coronado Expedition in uh, 1540. But who were these two groups of people who encountered one, each other more than 500 years ago? Well, the Castilum were just in the process of becoming a nation when Coronado's soldiers first traveled the Hopi country. Uh, the marriage of Queen Isabella and Ferdinand united the kingdoms of Castile and Aragon uh, in 1492, the year that Columbus kind of blundered into America. <laughs> but, uh, but two other things that were extremely important happened in 1492 as well. 
First of all, the last, last Moorish kingdom of Granada fell to the Spaniards. And secondly, the Jews were expelled from Spanish dominions. And this had huge repercussions on the kind of empire and the kind of attitudes that Spain brought to this encounter. And in, in a sense, it was a, a schizophrenic attitude. Because on the one hand, because the, most of the Iberian Peninsula had been conquered by, uh, by Muslims beginning in the 700s, no other region in Western Europe had more sustained contact with people of other religions and other languages. So there were seven centuries of practical experience of living together with Jews, with Muslims, and, and with all the intermixtures that happened because of that. But also during that 700s, the traditions of the Reconquista, the Christian reconquest of the Iberian Peninsula developed. And that forged uh, a definite warrior ethic among the Spaniards that was supported by a militant Catholicism. And so on the one hand, lots of experience living with other people. On the other hand, a very aggressive attitude towards conquering those people and incorporating them and forcing them into Spanish ways of life. And moreover, Spain and its empire were an extremely hierarchical society. There's a phrase you see in the documents, ambos majestades, God and king. And in the Spanish cosmology, all authority emanated from God and descended from above to the king of Spain in secular affairs, to the pope in religious affairs. So a very vertical hierarchy of authority. That was, uh, at least in its ideal form, absolute authority. Uh, and because of this, Spain took very seriously its obligation to save the souls of the peoples that it encountered in the Americas. Who were the Hopis? The Hopis now live on three mesas that are extensions of the much larger geographic uh, uh, feature the, called Black Mesa. But when the Spaniards first encountered the Hopis, there were Hopi communities on Antelope Mesa to the south and the east as well. Uh, these mesas were named by the Spaniards in the order that they reached them, coming from the east, first, second, third mesa, even though Arrivi was prob on third mesa was probably the oldest Spanish or Hopi community. And Hopis were very accomplished dryland farmers who not only cultivated on Black Mesa, but along the drainages in between. Uh, and interestingly, like the, the people that they called the Castilum, Hopis were in the process of forging their identities as well. Uh, according to the Hopi, they were, uh, when they emerged into the fourth world, they were offered the choice of ears of corn by Masao, the, the steward of the fourth world. They chose blue corn, which promised uh, a long lasting life, but a life of, of uh, hard work and hardship. And so that's the path that they embarked on. And moreover, Masao instructed them to spread out and to go on, in a sense, on journeys, on pilgrimages, before they found the center of the earth. So <clears throat> groups of matrilineal kin and the fundamental 
uh, unit of Hopi social organization is the matrilineal clan. Groups of kin moved across all different parts of the western United States and perhaps even Mexico until they began to return and converge on Hopi territory. And in the process, they left behind footprints, uh, uh, what we would call archaeological sites, petroglyphs, pictographs, that marked the journey of these clans on their way to finding the center of the earth. And uh, the Bear Clan was the first to arrive, and then when other, clan, other groups of people showed up, they had to petition to be admitted, and generally by performing a ritual that had to demonstrate that it had some value, some utility, for the people who were already living there. In the process, they developed an extremely complex religion, which now it, uh, really uh, organizes the annual calendar and is essentially split in half between the period of the year when the spiritual beings called Katsinam are present in Hopi communities and the other half of the year when they are not. And the Katsinam are these spiritual beings who mediate between the Hopis and uh, other deities and bring all, you know, many of the good things in Hopi life to the people. Now, archaeologists believe that the Katsinam religion uh, was something that developed rather late in the pre-Columbian period, perhaps during and after the great drought of the 13th century. Uh, and it spread across, uh, you know, was adopted by most Pueblo peoples, but it was particularly strong in the Western Pueblos, among the Hopi and the Zuni in particular. So this was a time of contraction because it was a very dry period. And it was a time when many groups of people converged on the Hopi mesas and became Hopi. So this process of identity was happening uh, when the, the Hopis and the Spaniards first came in contact with each other. Now, when that happened, uh, there were two institutions of conquest that the Spaniards used, introduced uh, among all of the Pueblo peoples of northern New Mexico and northern Arizona. The first was the mission, and, there, and uh, the missionaries who tried to evangelize the Hopis and other peoples of New Mexico were Franciscans. They weren't Jesuits like we had here in the Pimaria Alta. Uh, and they established missions at Awatavi uh, on Antelope Mesa, Sangopavi on Second Mesa, and at Arrive on Third Mesa, with uh, a several visitas or visiting missions uh, on, uh, at a, in other places. The other institution of conquest that was introduced and got as far as the Hopis was the encomienda which was not a land grant, but a grant to extract tribute from communities of native peoples in return for helping to defend the, the colony of New Mexico and supposedly for supporting the religious indoctrination of that community themselves. But in reality, what it meant that and there were three encomiendas, again, in the same communities that had missions, where the encomendero, the, the Spaniard who had this grant of tribute, was entitled to 2.6 bushels of corn and one cotton manta, or cloth, a year from Hopi households. So, 
in terms of contact between Spaniards and the Spaniards who missionized or, or uh, extracted tribute from the Hopis arrived from the east, from Santa Fe and northern New Mexico, not from the south. Uh, but there was, be before these missions were established, there was a long period of sporadic exploration, beginning with the Coronado expedition in 1540-41, and uh, about 40 years later, the, ex the expedition of Antonio de Espejo, and then finally in 1598, the expedition of Juan de Oñate, which actually founded the Kingdom of New Mexico in, uh, in northern New Mexico. Now, most of what we know about this encounter comes from the, the most complete account of the Coronado expedition. And that's the account of, of uh, Pedro de Castañeda, who never even visited the Hopis. He wasn't part of the detachment of Coronado soldiers who went west from New Mexico and visited them. Moreover, Castaneda wrote this account at least 20 years after Coronado had, uh, and other, other of his officials, had had to return to Spain to defend themselves against charges that they had inflicted great cruelties on, uh, on the native peoples of New Mexico. This is the, fir the very first encounter is the first time we encounter a significant discrepancy between the Spanish colonial documentary record and Hopi oral traditions. Because as even earlier than the Espejo expedition, Hopis and Zunis were, te were telling Espejo and also members of the Ibarra expedition, which never got as far as Hopi, that Coronado soldiers had destroyed a Hopi village when they visited there. Uh, anthropologists, for the most part, in the mid 20th century, dismissed those oral traditions because uh, there was no account of Coronado uh, soldiers doing so in the Coronado documents. Uh, these were, you know, again, again, the major document people have been relying on was written by somebody who was not even an eyewitness. The scholars who've done the most research with these documents lately, in the last 15 to 20 years, Richard and Shirley Flint have pointed out that violence is significantly underreported in the documentary record uh, of that Coronado expedition. So our question is, first of all, Hopis have been telling this story for over 400 years. They told it to the the next Spaniards who visited them after Coronado, they undoubtedly told other people about it. They were telling versions of the story in the early 20th century when uh, Anglo-Americans began to visit the Hopis and record what they heard. And Clark Tanakova told Stuart Koyayumtua a version of the story when he was interviewed in 2002. So, uh, you know, there's short of excavating on Antelope Mesa, which the Hopis will not permit, there may, no, may not be any definitive way to settle this question. But I would contend that these oral traditions should be given at least as much value as the documentary record, if not more. 
because in terms of consistency, they have been told and passed down from generation after generation for more than four centuries. Now we move into the mission period. And, <clears throat> you know, the, a critical thing to remember is that the Hopis were only missionized for a 50 year period. The first Franciscan missionaries did not arrive until 1629. The three missionaries who were there in 1680 were all killed, and the Hopis were the only Pueblo people who were not reconquered by the Spaniards after the Great Pueblo Revolt of 1680. So, uh, whatever oral traditions they have come from this, you know, 50 year period of time. This was a period of time when Pueblo peoples were dying from epidemics of old world diseases like smallpox and measles. Uh, it was a time when they were being required to support, uh, to provide cotton and, and foodstuffs to the encomenderos as well as to the missionaries. This was also a period beginning in the, at least the 1660s, of a prolonged drought, a very serious drought, according to the, to the tree ring record, in this region. And the thing about the tribute was that even though native populations were dec declining, in many cases, the amount of tribute attracted uh, extracted from these communities was the same. So in a period of time when climate made living precarious at best, you can imagine how the demands of Franciscan missionaries and Spanish encomenderos uh, shaved the margin of survival even closer to the bone. And moreover, the Franciscans aggressively suppressed native religions. So imagine you're no longer able to perform your ceremonies. The rain is not coming. There must have been, it must have been a tremendous psychological crisis as well as a physical crisis. And then you have missionary abuses. And probably the most widespread Hopi oral tradition about the missionaries is their abuses of Hopi women. And a common uh, uh, narrative is, is that a missionary who the Hopis called totatsi, which means tyrant, somebody who demands to be pleased, would say, I will only drink water that comes from a particular spring. And those springs were all 50 to 100 miles away. And they apparently would send Hopi men to fetch water from those springs while they, while they abuse their wives or their daughters. This is told by people in every Hopi community. So it's a very widespread tradition. The other thing they talk about is how the missionaries force them to cut uh, big beams of pine or spruce or fir from the San Francisco peaks, which are a very long way away from the Hopi mesas. So these are the two, two very common widely shared group traditions that are still being related. And then there are some documentary, you know, documentary accounts that hint at missionary abuses like this, such as the one described there in the PowerPoint. But the most damning is the case of uh, pa <coughs> Padre Fray Salvador de Guerra, who was a missionary at Arrive on Third Mesa in the 1650s. And 
his abuses were so great that the Hopi governors actually walked to Santa Fe to complain about them to his Franciscan superiors. And those superiors took it seriously enough to conduct a formal investigation. And he even came out to the Hopi Mesas to take testimony. And those are, that, the, that testimony revealed two types of abuses. One, that he had demanded far more than his fair share of cotton mantas from the Hopis, even though they claimed that he only gave them a half the amount of wool or cotton to make those mantas. But the most damning was the account of his torture and eventual murder of a Hopi man who was called Juan Kuna in the documents. Guerra accused Kuna of an unspecified quote-unquote idolatry, brought him to the mission church, whipped him inside the church, took him outside, poured scalding turpentine on his wounds, and then uh, supposedly was going to send him to, over to uh, New Mexico. But not surprisingly, he died along the way. The Franciscans took exhaustive testimony, including from many Hopis, and concluded that Guerra indeed was guilty. They uh, removed him from Hopi territory, confined him to the convento in Quaray, forbid him from performing any of the sacraments, and then supposedly remanded him to be punished by the highest Franciscan superiors in Mexico City. We don't even know if he ever went there, because three or four years later he was back in New Mexico, serving in various other missions, and then he became the secretary of Padre Fray Alonso de Posada, the person who was accused of, a, of having a wicked friendship, unquote, quote unquote, with a Hopi woman, and who was also uh, head of the Inquisition in New Mexico. So if he did go to Mexico City, they didn't keep him very long, and they sent him right back to New Mexico. Now, we had a three-day workshop of all of the, uh, uh, the Hopi Cultural Preservation Office has this cultural resource, resources advisory technical team. And it includes representatives from every Hopi community. And they get together periodically to advise the Hopi Cultural Preservation Office. We had a three-day workshop with uh, these individuals. And in the process, we visited a number of sites that were important to the Hopi uh, after, in the afternoon of those days. And during that time, Lee Kuanwisiwa, who is the head, the director of the Hopi Cultural <laughs> Preservation Office, told us the story of Sitkoima who was a Hopi man from Oribe, who, when the missionary was called away, decided that he would sponsor a home dance, a Naman ceremony, uh, in part because the Naman ceremony is where Hopi brides the previous year are presented in their wedding dresses to the community. And that's the conclusion of, of this very elaborate Hopi wedding ceremony. Since they had been unable to perform the Naman ceremony, these, these brides, including his daughter-in-law, had not been able to complete their wedding. So while the missionary was away, he and others gathered at a place that's now called Katsina Buttes, which is south of Third Mesa, 
uh, off to the west of the highway that lives up, li leads up to Kikotsmovi. And there they held, he sponsored this Niman ceremony, this home dance, which is when each Hopi community uh, says goodbye for the Katsinam for the year. And it's generally held in late June or July, kind of around the summer uh, solstice. And it's when the Katsinam return to places like the San Francisco Peaks before they come back again uh, uh, around the winter solstice. So the Naman ceremony was carried out in secret outside of Arrivi. But the missionary found out. And when uh, he came back, he hauled Sitkoima into the Oribe Plaza, had him whipped, had him scalded with turpentine, and he died. Now, we don't know whether Juan Cuna and Sitkoima were one and the same. I think it would be even more damning if they weren't. But one, according to Lee, this was this atrocity was one of the missionary acts that convinced the Hopis to join the Pueblo Revolt. But what's important to it for us is that even though we have this detailed investigation of Padre Fry Salvador de Guerra, you never, in none of the documents, in none of the testimonies, do you ever find out what act of idolatry Juan Cuna supposedly committed? Whereas this account gives you a glimpse into Hopi ceremonial life, into Hopi social life, and into the importance of these ceremonies to the Hopis. And that in my opinion, is by far the greatest contributions these oral traditions uh, provide. Because the documents can tell you who, what, where. But at least from the native points of view, they never tell you the why. And I think that oral traditions is the only way we're going to reconstruct the why when we try to tell this shared history of our pasts here in this region. Uh, but again, this apparently this, this torture and death of Sitkoima uh, helped convince the Hopis to participate in the Pueblo Revolt, where they killed their missionaries. And then 20 years later, when the people of Awadavi in Antelope Mesa apparently wanted to invite the missionaries back in, Hopis from the other communities attacked and killed the men of Awadavi and distributed women and children among the other Pueblos. This is still an open wound in Hopi society. Because Hopis pride themselves on being a peaceful people. So what would have driven them to, first of all, murder their missionaries, and secondly, murder their own people? And when we would talk about the project uh, in various communities up there, at times, it almost became like it was much more of a, than a lecture. It became kind of a combination of, of town meeting and, and almost group therapy session where people debated, do we confront this trauma? Do we talk about these painful episodes in our past? Or do we just let them lie? And that revealed to me one of the major themes that emerged out of this research. And this is, 
That's this concept of historical trauma. That in a sense like PTSD, except at the collective level. That collective traumas in the past can, that trauma can be passed down from one generation to another. And this is a concept that has been, I mean, there's scholarly work about, about it. Apparently it first arose, people first began to recognize it among therapists who were working with Holocaust survivors and their children. But then Native American therapists and scholars thought that it was applicable to their communities as well. And you can see uh, some of the, a definition of that from one of the most prominent native therapists. And uh, you know, the kind, of, the kind of behavior patterns that developed out of this trauma. Basically historical unresolved grief. And in the case of groups like the Hopis, there have been repeated collective traumas, not just one. But this really, this is, wasn't something that, this wasn't an insight that we came to. It was expressed best and most eloquently in one of the interviews that Stuart Koyuyumtawa carried out in the early days of the project with uh, a man, Elgin jo Joshe Bama, who was vice chair of the Hopi tribe at the time. And this was the only interview that Stuart carried out in English rather than Hopi. And I just want to read, I want to conclude by reading uh, a short section of that interview. Joshe Bama had been working with, with children who were suffering from sexual abuse uh, on, the, on the Hopi reservation. So that's what sort of sensitized him. And he said, but they, the priests, apparently came along so that they could do what they did, which was to claim all the souls wherever they went, the human souls. They claimed it for the Church of Spain, the Catholic Church. And so when you think about it, these people came without any regard or respect for who we are as a people. They did not ask, could we be your guests here? They didn't ask, can we partake of some of the agricultural things that you grow here? The maize and the other things, the beans that were growing here. They didn't ask if they could build the churches or their missions in our villages. They just simply intruded into Hopi lives and then enslaved us, enslaved our people, and then subjected Hopi to a very foreign way of life. But Hopi all this time had already had its own way of life. We had our own initiations. We had our own rituals. We had our own ceremonies. We had our own spiritual beings that we would talk to and pray to those. And then here comes a foreign intruder and totally tells us that that's not right. This is the way that your life has to be lived. And so they forced that kind of idea or that concept on us. And when any time anybody does that to somebody, it's, it's going to create a lot of feelings. It's going to create anger, but at the same time fear because what can you do about it when these people have the might of the weapon, the modern weapon at the time, and that they could kill you without any kind of respect given to whether you agree with them or not. So they just took completely away our freedom to live the kind of life that we had up to that point. So those are the things that I thought about when I saw the similarities between the victims of sexual abuse of children and when I, then when I look at our villages and how they were behaving. And the behavior was pretty much the same as what those children were showing as victims of abuse. And I concluded then that we, 
we must have been victims of abuse at some point. And that's when I thought back on our history and I thought of that period. That's when this abuse happened to us because they also carried out a lot of different kinds of acts that were immoral. And then he goes on to d describe the missionary abuses that we heard from almost anyone. So I'm going to stop there, but again, uh, it's things like that that very quickly, that you know, made this project much more than a simply an academic project for me and at least some of my colleagues. So uh, I'll stop there and I think we have time for questions, Chris. Yeah. We definitely have some time for questions, so um, and I will come running at you with the microphone. Just uh, let me know if you have a question for Tom. Where, where did you find the written sources, Spanish documents? Uh, well, a lot of them we had <coughs> microfilm copies of in the Office of Ethnohistorical Research at the Arizona State Museum, that project that I talked about that Dale Brenneman is director of now. Uh, but we also visited archives in, in Mexico City, in Seville, in Madrid, um, you know, all the major archives that, that are repositories of these, of documents about this region. The problem is, is that, uh, and this is the same problem that scholars of other Pueblo communities in New Mexico face, is that many of those documents apparently were destroyed during the Pueblo Revolt, and so far nobody has uncovered any copies. So uh, there's relatively little uh, record of that period, pri you know, the 17th century, prior to the Pueblo Revolt, uh, you know, when Spaniards were living next to or among the Pueblo peoples of both New Mexico and, and Western Arizona. I'd like to remind us that uh, Emory Sikakwapu was really in the Bureau of Applied Research and Anthropology <laughs> for many years, and that prior to this project that you have talked about, he dedicated at least 15 years of his life to comprising, to compiling the world's most foremost Native American language dictionary, the Hopi English Dictionary. And that that document was not really a linguistic document, but in Emory's mind, it was a social document in which he saw this as a way of, I think, recapturing and reinforcing Hopi identity and making sure that Hopi language would continue. He had a, a very well-articulated vision of what Hopi language should be in Hopi society, similar to the way that Spanish is used uh, amongst our Native our Mexican American brothers and sisters. That is a language that people were fluent in both of these languages because it meant to him that this was a way of, of preserving a Hopi culture that he had de dedicated his life to. Yeah, you're actually absolutely right, Tim. And one of uh, Emory's colleagues, Ken Hill, is here in the audience today as well. So uh, yeah, that, that work was absolutely fundamental. And uh, you know, we, we were building on work that Emory had done. Uh, Emory really, he wanted to make, he not only wanted to record the language and perpetuate the speaking of it, but he also wanted to make Hopi literate in their own language as well. And that's beginning to happen. Uh, for example, Stuart Koyayumtua is, is you know, one of the relatively few people 
who not only speaks Hopi, but can translate from Hopi to English. And, and you know, we look at this project as, been, as being a very small contribution to that process. You know, my feeling, and I, I wrote in the, in the first volume, is that we've only skimmed the surface of collective Hopi knowledge about the past. And it's not, not that every Hopi has this knowledge, because uh, much of it is maybe restricted to, to different clans, to people initiated into different ceremonies. But I don't think we've you know, even with the work we've done, we've, you know, we've, we've done anything more than skim the surface of knowledge about the past. And my colleague Dale Brenneman, who's now the director of the Office of Ethnohistorical Research, is also carrying out a similar project with uh, Atom and Peeposh that, you know, you may want to act, ask her about. Uh, again, having uh, you know, a panel of Atom uh, elders and experts comment on what the Spaniards are saying. But I really think that uh, if, we're any, if we're ever going to move, whatever you want to call it, ethno-history -his forward, we have to have systematic you know, examination of some of these oral traditions. But it takes a long time, and it, you know, it's not something that you can do uh, on a grant timetable often. Certainly not. I would never recommend that somebody do it as a dissertation project. <laughs> I also want to remind everybody that we have a reception outside here on the Lido deck. Uh, that you <laughs> Thank you, Tom. Um, so you mentioned that, that some of this material might become, or you hope that some of the material might become part of new books or teaching. But it's a very traumatic history, and it's um, you know by sharing the historical trauma with children, how do you resolve the sort of increasing the sense of trauma, perhaps? And then, how do you respond to that so as to deal with what happens when you share this history? Well, first of all, it would never be a decision of mine. You know, we made it very clear from the beginning that anything, any information that came out of these interviews with Hopi elders or from our group meeting with the, with the, the CRAD advisory group, that the Hopi tribe would have the final say about whether to publish or share that or not. And the only thing up to this point that they've requested is that occasionally that a phrase be left in Hopi. But uh, I mean, I, I don't have the expertise to answer that question, Diana. It would have to be a decision that the tribe and teachers and people, you know, who are, who know about uh, children of different ages, when and how material like that could be presented. But, uh, and, and, you know, we've, we haven't done anything at this point other than talk about it. Here's one down here, Jeff, Jeff. You mentioned that the Owato was destroyed because they invited the Catholic missionaries back. I've never heard that. Is that an establishment of the Hopi oral history, or is that just some of the documents that are going to be back? That is the most common interpretation, and it comes primarily from. Uh, the documents and also from material that was recorded by some of these early anthropologists. Uh, I think the Hopi interpretations of that, what little I've seen, is much more complex. 
that there may have been other reasons for that to have happened. It certainly was the interpretation that the Spaniards gave. Yeah, we've, uh, as I said, people, people are often reticent to share. And, you know, we're not, you know, it's up to it's up to the Hopis themselves whether some of those accounts, whether they wish to share them or not. Uh, what I've read in, you know, primarily work by non-Hopis, but who have spent far more time up there than I have, as I say, you know, it, it seems to be a, a much more complex story than the version that I'm, I'm talking about. But whether or not people want to share that, have it published or not, I don't know. Do you have any thoughts on that? I would, lo I would love to talk to you about that. And have you talked with anybody in the Hopi Cultural Preservation Office about this? Because, you know, the whole purpose of this, we haven't, that, that is not covered in the first volume. That's something that we're still working on. So uh, if, if, if people were willing to share that, we, we would be very, very interested in it.
emergency mode for me to go around and to adapt to do the live you know, to, to survive. And so those are things that I think, you know, um, you know are, are in place and that, you know, and for to get some type of little history like this is, is great. And it, it's good that, you know, now we're beginning to hopefully document that. But there are there is a lot more history. Um, just to comment on Mr. Johnson's comment there, you know, and there are various, you know, um, uh, different people out there that have different histories, and depending on who you talk to, where you, you know, which village they're coming from, you know, give you a little bit more perspective on that. And so again, you know, with me and then from third Mesa, you know, um, we have first Mesa, we have the second Mesa, and it, it's true that we have this oral history, and it's it's been continuous, it's, it's still significant today. And so, you know, just, you know, to comment on that and that, you know, hopefully, you know, there are more documentations, but again, we have to also be cognizant of, you know, our privacy and our, our you know, um, and to our protection. Thank you. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, Tom. <clears throat> Thank you, Jeff.